Good morning. 
Welcome to First Congregational Church of Lowell. We are proud to be a, um, an open and affirming congregation through the United Church of Christ. And we are thrilled that each and every one of you are here with us this morning. Um, we have people here in service and also on Zoom. So we are thankful that everyone found a way to be with us this morning and that we can worship together. Um, I am not Shannon. Shannon is off enjoying opening day today. So let's uh, um, think of her as she is somewhere in the rain, which sounds way not pleasant to me, but it is what it is. So I will be sharing a few announcements with you this morning, starting with the Thanksgiving meal that is coming up, dare I say it, in two weeks. So we are having a meal from 12 to 2. It will be takeout only. If you and yours would like to reserve a meal, you still can. I believe they are also still asking for a few morning volunteers to prepare and give out those meals from 12 to 2. So if you have some time to volunteer, let Shannon know. She can get you connected. Also let Shannon know if you are interested in a meal for yourself. Also, the youth group will be going to the Boundary Waters next year, summer 2021. Um, and so they have started a fundraiser for this trip, for this endeavor. They're calling it the Ding Dong Ditch. So what it is, is um, you can pay $20 to send someone a little goodie basket. The goodie basket will be assembled by the youth and delivered by the youth as well. So $20 will go directly towards the youth group. Um, if you are a family with a young person and you're a young person would like to participate, November 21 from 9 to 12 is when they will come to the church for a nice socially distanced masks required um, assembly party. And if you are a person who would like to send a basket, um, you can let Shannon know, again, they are $20 a basket. You can send them to someone you know and love or send it anonymously, um, or just say, here's $20, send a basket to someone you think needs it. We're happy to do that as well. Um, so either way, it'll be kind of a fun fundraiser for the youth. Also, just a heads up, putting this on your radar, there will be a formal announcement forthcoming, but I wanted to let you know now that we have available a few amendments to our constitution, as well as a proposition to once again, extend our um, church budget another six months. So we are having a congregational meeting on December 6 to vote on these, um, but copies are available now. So because we are proposing amendments that has to be available several weeks in advance for a period of comment. So you should have seen that come through in your email. We we also have hard copies available out here if you prefer to peruse a hard copy. Um, if you would like to request a hard copy mailed to you, we can do that as well. Just let me know. Um, actually, I think we sent some out, but if you didn't get one or you have trouble reading it or you need it to figure it out, let us know. We'll get you a copy. And if you have comments, please let myself or Nikki or Grace Heisinga know um, for comment period. Um, we also have many of these cute little knit hats available. Zoom. Um, if you or anyone you know, or you can think of like an agency or a group of people, maybe some teachers in your life or their classroom, if you know of anyone in need of some hats, we have many, many available. These were hand knit by a lovely woman who loves to do this as a service this time of year. So please um, let me know if you're interested in a few and I will point you in the right direction. Also, oh man, I'm going to announce this at the top this time. Um, we are still taking a designated offering for the furnace repair. I will tell you the grand total next week, but I will say you all are amazingly generous with your giving towards this. We so appreciate the worry, the dent that the offerings are making in our worry of having to make this repair. So if you are still interested in designating, you certainly can. Um, I'll be excited to announce um, next week what we've, what we've raised. And finally, we do, because we are meeting in person, we are meeting with, of course, limited capacity and many safety measures in place, um, but we do have some needs for some volunteers. So we're preparing a COVID time and talent. So volunteering looks very different in this time than it does normally. Um, so stay tuned for more details on that, but start thinking maybe what is something you'd be willing to do if you have some time during your week to 
to do something to help the church, to help us put on service on Sunday mornings. Again, I know not everyone's comfort level allows them to be here, but there are quite a few opportunities for being alone in the building during the week to do some things. So start thinking there will be an opportunity to perhaps plug in in a few weeks. Also a few prayer requests. Um, we are praying for Trinity, Kyle Hulse niece who tested positive for COVID, just praying for continued um, asymptomatic Ness and um, that she, you know, that it won't spread from anyone or from her to anyone else. We are also praying for Linda Hamp and family at um, a loss in the family and just praying for them as they grieve in this time. Also, I would like to offer up a prayer for leadership in all play places and spaces as decision making is once again becoming very challenging and navigating towards the right direction is also becoming more difficult as well. So let's just keep leadership in general in our prayers. And with that, we will now have a time to meet and greet one another. Um, for those of us that are here and those of you on Zoom, this morning we are going to greet each other with our hands in the form of a heart. So just give those around you a little heart. People on Zoom heart each other and we will just greet one another with the love that we wish we could show with more physical contact. Please join me now in a call to worship. God of life, you are as near to us as our breath. Touch our eyes that we may see you in one another. Open our ears that we may hear your voice in the cries of the oppressed. Enter our hearts that we may be filled with your love toward all people. Come, O God of life and breath and wholeness, be with us now. Show us the way to new life and grant us the courage to be people of your way. Amen. We will now sing I have a musical moment. Um, we are going to be turning to number 478 in the hymnal. Um, I've got peace like a river and just a forewarning for anyone Deborah and I were talking about how confusing the the score is so we're going to sing each verse through twice it'll probably feel more natural to you than you realize but we're going to sing through twice each verse.
with a pre-recorded children's message. So, Gavin, do you want to come forward or do you want to plop where you are? Fair enough. So. Okay. Oh, Zoom, we're having some issues with sharing it with you. Um, Rachel, yeah, we could post it online later. Rachel could always show it to Gavin in worship. That sounds good. We will post, so for those of you on Zoom, we're gonna post Shannon's message online later. You'll probably be able to find it on the Facebook page. Um, for any children on Zoom, you can check that out later. And for Gavin, you will check it out in just a few minutes, it sounds like. Um, and the rest of us will have time with the scripture later. <laughs> so I think with that, Gavin, you can head out for children's time. And the rest of us are gonna to transition to scripture. This morning, we are going to be reading from the book of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 14 through 21. For it is as if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things, and I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, have what is yours. But the master replied, you wicked and lazy slave. You knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return, I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with the ten talents. For to all those who have, more will be given, and they will have abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Here ends the lesson. May God transform understanding into action. Amen. <clears throat> so remember how a few weeks ago, I mentioned that reading texts from about the end times invites us to use our imaginations. End times being readings typically found from the book of Revelation, sections of the book of Daniel, 
and other select sections of scripture, both in the Bible and in the Apocrypha, which we've read from together before. We don't read these kinds of texts very often, likely because for our modern church, texts like this are used to instill fear and shock people into obedience. And in our church, we aren't really about that. But a couple weeks ago, we did read from the book of Revelation, and I encouraged everyone to be willing to hear that text with an open imagination, to let that text speak to us in different ways and be a source of encouragement and empowerment to us rather than one of fear-mongering and threat. Well, what if I said that we needed to apply that same sort of open imagination to this text from the gospel this morning? I know that we are probably used to hearing this text in a way that leads to a sermon on stewardship or generosity or wise money management. But what if I said that this text is actually one about the end times? End times. Are we therefore able to approach this text in new and different ways and let it encourage and empower us rather than maybe make us feel uncomfortable or perhaps a little guilty? Can we have an open imagination to what Jesus might be saying here about what living should look like for us in anticipation of what comes next? So let me explain a bit. The reason that we can assume this text was intended to take on an end times approach is because it is situated in between Jesus telling other parables more obviously related to end times language. Specifically, this is the third of four parables in which Jesus teaches about the impending yet unscheduled end. This is one of Jesus's closing teachings just days before his own impending end. We can also make this assumption because this parable differs from the similar parable found in other gospels. So we know the same story is often told by all the the different gospel writers. And in the other gospels, this one takes on a very different tone. It is much more related to generosity and money management. Whereas this one, has kind of a weird ending that makes you start to question how this is about stewardship given Jesus chastising that frugal servant for his wise and conservative investment. This version of the parable gets a little fuzzy if we're trying to talk about stewardship. So instead of framing it like the other gospels version of this parable, I wanna frame this parable like those end times parables in Matthew before and behind it. All four of them focus on the return of the Messiah. So this is something that we know is promised throughout texts like Daniel and Revelation. But this is the first of its kind. This is foreshadowing of what is to come. Jesus is the first one to state that the Messiah will come back, that there will be a judgment in that time for how people acted before, and how that action should look now. This is the first introduction to traditional apocalyptic theology and is used as one framework for how people think the end will come about. Now, which framework and how and when and what about the end times is highly contested in the church and beliefs and theology about it vary greatly across the spectrum. In fact, beliefs about it probably vary greatly in this church too. I personally don't believe the specific framework of how and when and what matters much to how it has implications on our life now. The specifics of it don't really change how we're expected to act in the here and now while we wait for whatever that looks like. All that is super clear in apocalyptic literature throughout scripture. Even when the details and the timeline and the who and the what and the why and the when is fuzzy, the implications are serious and clear. And this is what should really matter to us anyway. And what I think becomes apparent when we read this gospel text this morning from that perspective with an open imagination 
we start to see those commands for living now come alive. Let's walk through it. We know that a slave master had three slaves that he wanted to entrust some money to while he goes away for a bit in hopes that they yield a little bit of return on investment. He gives each one a different amount according to their varying abilities. Now, we aren't told what kind of abilities, so there's some room for interpretation there. What does that mean? But anyway, off they go. The one who was given the most talents, who presumably had the most abilities, went out, did some wheeling and dealing in the marketplace, and came back with double the amount of talents he started with. The second slave, who was given the second highest amount and had the second highest abilities, again, we don't know what that means, went out to do some wheeling and dealing in the marketplace and also doubled the amount. The third slave, who received the least, went and buried the talent in the ground for safekeeping. They did no wheeling and dealing, no trading, no marketplace, and earned nothing, but also lost nothing. The slave played it safe, whereas the other two inevitably embarked on some risk in order to earn big and double the investment. So for any of you who have ever visited with a financial advisor or a wealth manager, you know that not only do you have decisions about how much and where to invest your money, you also have to decide how much risk you're willing to involve in your investment. Do you wanna risk big where things are a little more volatile and the gain could be higher, but so could the loss? Or do you prefer to play it safe and just expect stability and maybe a gradual growth as well? The financial expert can guide you in making these choices, but ultimately that is your money and your call to make, your personal willingness to risk. And that is not unlike the choice that was given to each of these slaves. They had an opportunity to choose their level of risk and how they were going to handle these resources. Their comfortability with risk absolutely showed in the outcome of their investment. But with what comes next in the text is where this really stops being about the talents and the money and the stewardship. This is where we learn a little something about risk and how it pertains to living in anticipation of the end. So when the master returns, the three present their earnings to the master. The first two present identical speeches about what they did and how successful they were at doubling their earnings. And the master gives them identical praise about how good they are, how proud he is, and how in, he in turn will now give them more responsibility. And then the last slave, who by all accounts did the most prudent thing, was up. He spoke to the master and he said, I know you to be a harsh man, and I was afraid that if I did this wrong, it would upset you. So I hid it, I kept it safe. The master indeed responds harshly, but not because the slave lost the talent, but because he did not increase his talent. He says, you could have at least invested it in the bank so it would have gained interest over time but instead you bury it where it will sit idle. The master then says that those who have will be blessed with more and they will have abundance. But for those who have nothing, all will be taken away and they will be thrown into darkness with weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's a pretty harsh and scary message for someone who simply chose to play it safe. And this, is where it becomes problematic to apply this parable to lessons of stewardship. This, those who have more will have more and those who don't will have less thing, doesn't seem to fit with Jesus's other teachings about the poor and the outcast being beloved in the kingdom of heaven. And the seemingly recklessness of market business dealings being applauded doesn't seem much like Jesus either. And the greed, coming through from the master wanting to see gain makes me question Jesus's teaching here. It seems to me like the Jesus of the gospels would actually be the slave to bury the money 
in the ground to maybe save it for someone who might need it rather than multiply it for selfish gain. Well, this is where we need to engage our imaginations. Let's look at talents as being more than just money. A talent was absolutely a form of currency in this time in the parable, a very large one, in fact. So Jesus was referring to monetary dealings in this parable. In our modern day language, we talk about money as money. We no longer use talent as a form of currency. But in the church, we do still talk about our talents, don't we? We talk about it in terms of using it, our gifts and our skills for ministry, which is exactly what Jesus was using this money language to represent. Jesus is speaking literally of talents as currency, but is speaking figuratively of talents as gifts, skills, and expertise. So here we do have a parable that could be applied to stewardship but can and also should be applied to our everyday mission and ministry. This text doesn't tell us how to invest and multiply or save and hide. It tells us how to live. And then, just like that, the harsh rhetoric of the slave master starts to make some sense. The risk that the first two slaves took reaped a reward and praise and responsibility by the master. The fear demonstrated by the third slave caused them to do nothing, resulting in shame and an unfulfilling future from the master. This third slave is not a bad person. They are careful, prudent, and seemingly wise to protect their resources in this way. Great risk could lead to great loss after all, and the worst outcome for this slave would be to lose what the master had entrusted to him. They chose to play it safe rather than be seen as reckless or worse yet, a loser. It bears wondering, engaging our imagination a bit, what would have happened if the risks taken by the first two slaves had yielded a loss? Would the master have chastised them for risking and then losing? Based off of the reaction of the master to the third slave, I am going to venture a no. I might suggest that the master would have actually applauded them for their efforts and their confidence. This parable is not touting a goal of doubling your money and accumulating wealth. It's touting a goal of living of investing, of risking. It's about Jesus himself and how he lived and engaged and taught and ultimately what would happen to him. Jesus risked big throughout his whole life and ministry and it cost him. Jesus did not double his investment. In fact, he lost big. But since it's not about wealth and losing, it's about risk and living, and that is what Jesus wanted of his audience after he was gone. This is what he was telling them. He was letting them know that he expected the same type of risk and confidence and investment from them and from us. The master in this parable, who we should now know is Jesus, represents Jesus, wants us to know that the worst risk that we could take is not risking at all to not care deeply and profoundly enough about anything to risk not acting, to not open ourselves enough to let our hearts be stirred, to let ourselves invest in the things that God cares about. The greatest loss that we could experience would be to act prudently and cautiously, to play it safe, and to withhold our talents from God's world. We're pretty preoccupied right now with identifying narcissism and egomania and pride. We see it everywhere. But what if just for a moment, we could work on identifying the opposite, identifying sloth, perhaps in ourselves or in our church? Sloth being not caring, not rejoicing, 
and not living up to one's full potential and not celebrating one's humanity by living life with all that we have, by not investing, by playing it safe, by being cautious and prudent and burying our talents in the ground to never be enjoyed by anyone. What if that is the risk that leads us to an unfulfilling life upon the end? Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who we know to be someone who risked big to do the right thing, once said that the greatest sin of respectable people is running from responsibility. The responsibility to do what is required of us when God's world demands it. The responsibility to be in tune enough to the needs of those around us to know exactly when we must risk because our compassion is stirring. The responsibility to invest our talents where we know they will multiply. Bonhoeffer's sense of responsibility ushered him from a stance of pacifism to participating actively in the plan to assassinate Hitler. And that risk cost him his life. So let me, as your not financial planner or wealth advisor, but as your talent advisor, let me ask you, where are you on a scale of risk from Jesus and Bonhoeffer to sloth? And where do you want to be? When I read this text in this way, my imagination comes alive with what Jesus is teaching about responsibility and risk, especially knowing that for Jesus, what was at stake was the future, the end, and the promise. We ought to keep that in mind too. What are the stakes? What are the stakes if we don't risk, if we play it safe, if we withhold our talents? Well, according to Jesus, the stakes are high and the outcome isn't pretty. The outcome of not caring, of not loving passionately, of not investing yourself and not risking anything is something akin to death or a lifetime of utter darkness. I know that we are in a time where being safe is everyone's number one priority. But I wanna challenge the notion that safety is all that any one of us should be focused on. What if synonymous with safety, we were concerned about well-being? And what if synonymous with staying healthy, we were concerned with social health? What if in our own strides to stay safe, we didn't fall back on playing it safe. What I am asking is, how can we ensure that the echoing rhetoric of 2020 to stay safe and stay home doesn't mean that we fall back on the scale to sloth? Our responsibilities haven't ended. This is not a time for people who claim to be people of faith to stop engaging, to stop investing, and to stop risking. How can we continue to invest our talents in God's world? How can we continue to be in tune with the needs of our community? How can we continue to nurture our sense of compassion and be willing to risk? How can we, while staying safe, not play it safe? There's one final element of this parable that I think it's important to touch on because I know risk itself may be a tricky word for people to describe the, how people of faith might engage in the world, lest it become a slippery slope to recklessness, which is ultimately not such a positive thing. But I wanna draw our attention back to that third slave. He said something that's super important, I think, for us to remember. The, the third slave specifically said that he buried his talent in the ground because he was afraid. Fear is what drove him to bury his talent out of preservation. 
So I think it's worth noting that if you feel uncomfortable with the idea of risk, perhaps what should also be said is that Jesus doesn't ask fear to be the driving force for any of us to be cautious or prudent. Instead, we must act in confidence, knowing that we might lose and risk might not pay off, but with no ounce of fear that our efforts will not be rewarded. Because the worst risk is not risking. Fear has no place in the heart of a person who claims to follow Jesus. And again, I know that we are in a time where fear, anxiety, and uncertainty are at an all-time high. So the question in this unique time becomes, how can we honor these things that we are rightfully experiencing while also staying true to our mission in the world of not and not letting fear hold us back. Because what Jesus wants us to know is that there are no excuses for cowering away from our responsibilities. But how we engage those responsibilities in this time might look different. We have all been given different talents much like the characters in the parable. So how we invest them might look a little different as well. And we can engage our imaginations to come to understand what responsibilities we're being drawn to. Can we use those imaginations to ponder our talents and the ways that we can invest them? But here's what I feel like I need to say, and you can send me hate mail for this later, I can handle it, but I'm gonna say it anyway. This investment, this risk, this care that I'm talking about has to be done offline, away from the internet, away from social media. The internet and social media have brought new possibilities for us to engage people in this time of physical distancing. And for that, we can be super thankful, but Boy, do I hate to see that replace things like community engagement and advocacy and education and social interaction. I think that we've become a little too comfortable with social media and being the new platform for these things where the riskiest thing that we can do is leave a harsh comment on someone's political post without the consequence of having to see them in a couple of days. So even in this time of physical distancing, what Jesus is asking of us has to be done offline. So how do we engage, risk, and invest all while staying safe in 2020? Well, how about starting with a phone call? Certainly call your loved ones, but also call people you haven't talked to in a while. Maybe even someone you don't agree with and be willing to have that tough conversation with them. Maybe instead of labeling someone as too tough to love, find the thing in them that God sees in them. For me, I think I'm going back to committing to have a weekly conversation with someone who is very important to me, but who I previously labeled as sucking away too much of my energy. Or how about finding different ways to spend your time now that we all have a little more of it? Do some donating. Find a need in your local sphere and see how you can meet it. There are many places offering safe ways to still engage in meeting community need through volunteering, donating, giving, including church. For me, that is going to look like donating my time to the Thanksgiving meal that we're hosting here in a couple weeks instead of spending that time with my family. Or how about seeking some education? Maybe taking your mind off of COVID for a while and studying something else through a book or a podcast or a virtual seminar. Maybe something you've always been interested in and haven't had the time to engage or maybe something you wanna be more articulate about, 
or maybe something that will challenge you and help you understand this world we're living in a little better. For me, I am going to pick up a book that I've had on my shelf for two years um, and finally invest the time to read it to become a little more articulate about generational trauma. These are just examples. I believe that there are a number of different things that you can decide to do for yourself. But the important thing is to assess whether you are slipping into burying your talents in the ground and acting out of fear, rather than being brave and expanding your horizon of responsibility. Being a person of faith isn't as much about what you believe as how you engage with God's precious world and show those beliefs in action, even in a pandemic. God has given each and every one of us special talents to be invested and used and strengthened. And we have the responsibility to live our lives as fully as possible so that we show the world that we care, that we are willing to do the hard things, willing to risk, and that our compassion runs deep. God has also given us the imagination to explore these things, even when we might feel afraid or when we have unique worries, like at this time of staying safe. I believe and hope that we can stay safe without playing it safe. Now through this parable, we know that the stakes are too high for fear to be our driving force and that Jesus risked everything for us, making it clear what we ought to do, to invest our talents frivolously and confidently so that we might gain wealth by living our fullest lives and loving with the fullest of our hearts, all that we might one day make it to the finish line and receive nothing but praise from our creator. So, with the stakes in mind, the clarity about what to do, I want to ask again and leave you with this thought. As your talent advisor, I am asking you, where are you on the risk scale and where do you want to be? Amen. Please rise in body or in spirit as you are able. We will say the words of our mission statement together. Responding to the living God with a progressive voice and working hands, we are called to feed Christ's community in mind, body, and spirit. Amen. You may be seated. We will now enter into a time of prayer. We will close this time together by saying the words of the Lord's Prayer, if you would like. Um, please know that if you have prayer requests or joys and praises, just things you want to share um, to be prayed for corporately with this church, you can always email me. You can email Lori Ingram, and we will be sure to share those with the community. But with that, I'll just pray. Holy God, you welcome us into your joy and entrust us with your gospel. In hope for the world to come and with love for the world you made, we offer our prayers for your church, your earth, and your people. For your church in this community and around the world, that your good news may be proclaimed to all. God of grace, Hear our prayer. For oppressors, that they might know justice, and those oppressed, that they might know peace. God of grace, hear our prayer. For your creation, that we may be the caretakers you intend, that we might serve lovingly and care graciously. God of grace, hear our prayer. For the young amongst us, 
that they might be nurtured in love. God of grace, hear our prayer. And for the old amongst us, that they might be secure in your care. God of grace, hear our prayer. For those who fight the demons of addiction, that they might find relief. God of grace, hear our prayer. For those who face an early death and those that they leave behind, that they might be comforted. God of grace, hear our prayer. For all of those who care for the suffering and those in their charge, that they would be freed from pain and fear. God of grace, hear our prayer. For all of those about whom we worry and those whose troubles are only known to you, God of grace, hear our prayer. All of this and more, we pray with gratitude for your eternal love and extravagant grace. In the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We are now going to move into a time of offering. You are welcome to walk any offerings you have forward here. You are also welcome to offer by mail to do so online. And as I've mentioned before, we are again re-engaging this idea of time and talent and what it means to continue to serve this church as we try to keep our ministry and mission here alive. So Deborah will play us some meditative music for us to just ponder and, and be with those thoughts in this time.
standing if you are able we will have one final meditative song moment for us to close out this morning we will be turning to number 407 three verses, three verses. for being with us this morning again so thankful for your commitment to this church and for your work and continuing to see this ministry thrive we're thankful for multiple ways to engage these days but of course um, nothing beats you know being able to talk and chat and communicate offline right so thank you again everyone for being here i hope your weeks are blessed and wonderful and filled with all of the good things that you love with that Go in peace.